therefore, since we have this ministry, as we received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You can be seated. Emmanuel Bible Church is a Protestant church. What does that mean? I'm often asked, what does it mean to be a Protestant church? And to answer that question, it's really impossible to answer it without giving a little bit of a brief historical summary. The Protestant Reformation really began in the 1400s with the the Renaissance and swept through Europe like wildfire throughout the 1500s. Listen, it is impossible to overstate how much the Protestant Reformation changed Western civilization. If you go back to the 1300s before the Renaissance and the Reformation began, you wouldn't recognize the church, you wouldn't recognize a church service, you wouldn't recognize the culture, you wouldn't recognize the world. In the 1300s, literacy was almost completely absent. There was really no such thing as as commerce or business. We use, in fact, Arabic numerals to this day in English because in Europe during that time there was no, there was no commerce or trade or business almost to speak of at all. There was no need for mathematics in that sense. There was no unified language. There were no maps. There were no roads really to speak of. The best roads in the 1300s were built by the Romans a thousand years earlier. Inside the church, things were even more separate from how we experience them today. There was no concept of preaching in the church. There was no concept of corporate singing in the church. You would never sing a song in the church. There was no scripture in the church. In fact, scripture hadn't been available in the language that people could read for for 500 years. It was illegal to translate the Bible into a language people could understand. Being caught in possession of a Bible was a, a capital offense. The Pope was the head really of the world. Emperors served at his pleasure. Emperors were under his authority. Kings were all under the emperor and everything flowed from the Pope. Marriage was in disarray. Morality was in disarray. In some sense, the authority of the Catholic Church was universal. It was everything in the world fell under that authority. But in any practical sense, the authority started and stopped at the church. The church had nothing to say for how you lived your life or how you parented or how'd you, how you worked or what you did with your money. I mean, in many ways, there was almost no sense of an individual during that time. There was a secular, sacred distinction. You were part of the masses or you were one of the priests or monks or, or nuns. And the two didn't have anything to do with each other. I mean, the, if you were part of the, the sacred side, a priest, a monk, or a nun, you wore different clothes, you had a different haircut, you had different laws, you paid different taxes, you had your own brothels. <laughs> it was an entirely different world for that class. For everybody else, they were in their own category. There was no concept of individual work ethic or of savings or anything like that. The Pope was supreme and had more authority than anything else in the world. But in the 1400s, things began to fall apart from that worldview. First of all, there became two popes, two rival popes. For over 50 years, there were two different popes. And when one died, he replaced somebody else from his own line. And when the other died, he replaced himself with somebody else. So for 50 years, there were two different popes, both of which excommunicated each other both of which called the other the Antichrist, prompting Erasmus, a scholar of that time, to say that they were both (laughs) half-rights.
Now, how did they get away with this for so long? How did people not notice there were two rival popes? And the truth is not really. There was no newspapers. And even if there were, there was no literacy. The only people that knew about that were connected to the church, who, of course, had a huge incentive to not make a big fuss about it. But in the 1400s, a lot of things changed. First of all, the printing press was invented and, and news could travel. Literacy was, was valued. There were uh, exploration, world exploration. They found old manuscripts of the Bible. People found not just biblical manuscripts, but people found the writings of the Greek philosophers, and they begin to learn Greek and translate those works into the modern languages. And people begin to read, and universities were found and begin to grow and educate people. And, and suddenly, as people read the scriptures, they saw this has nothing to do with the way the Catholic Church is actually operating. They have nothing in common with each other. And this provoked a wave of reformation that swept through, swept through Europe. And as people begin to, to learn about the dysfunction in the church, two rival popes excommunicating each other, the church clamped down on it and they convened a council of their cardinals. And the council overthrew both popes, deposed both popes and put in a third. And when this got out, that just rattled the worldview of, of everybody. I mean, listen, by the 1400s, it was 600 years that Western civilization was defined by the mindset that the Pope was supreme, 600 years. To put that in a little bit of historical context, our country is, what, 235 years old, more or less? The average life expectancy today is the 70s, 80s. Back in this time, the average life expectancy was in the 30s, early 40s, and that Pope's supremacy had been the foundation for worldview for over 600 years. And now the curtain was being pulled back and people saw that the Pope isn't supreme. If a council of cardinals can fire not just one, but two popes, then obviously the council is above the Pope. And this started a tidal wave of skepticism. A wildfire of reformation swept through, through Europe. Now, many people left the Catholic Church by, by the droves. They rejected the authority of the Pope. And many of them went to secularism or humanism, modernism, rationalism. They didn't go to Christ. They didn't go to the scriptures. They went to science and the, the worth of, of investigation, denying the supernatural. Much of Renaissance scholarship came from that stream of thought. But many other people fled to the scriptures, which they could now read for the first time. And preaching began to return to to pulpits for the first time in centuries. And people begin to understand the gospel and they begin to gather around what the true gospel really is. And those people were called Protestants. By the time the dust settled at the end of the 1500s, I mean, nothing would be the same, really. The Pope lost his supremacy over, over the world. The Holy Roman Empire ceased to exist as any really meaningful entity at all. Governments became local. Kings came to power. Kings then spoke the language of their own people, which would have been unheard of in the Holy Roman Empire. Laws became local. The worth of the individual was esteemed. This idea of scholarship and what you actually believe in your own heart became valued. The idea of individual wealth and economics became stressed. I mean, it's not an exaggeration to say that from this time we get our idea of the separation of church and state, of local governments. Democracy grew out of this. Work ethic grew out of this. Currency and wealth and savings and business business ethics all grew out of this. I mean, it turned the world upside down. But specifically in the church, things change. In Protestant churches, it would cease to look anything like the world, the Western world had seen in 600 years as a church. You had preaching, you had singing, you had this idea that people were part of a church and they served each other in the church. Wow. It had this idea that the church was made up of the individuals, not the priests. The people were the church and they worshiped and ministered together and they glorified God in the way they lived their lives. This was a a radical new view. And this happened all over the Western world in different countries, in different languages, with different leaders simultaneously, in many cases, independent of each other. Of course, Luther in Germany and Calvin in in Geneva and Zwingli in in Zurich and John Knox in in Scotland and Thomas Cranmer and others in in England and you had reformers in France and in Holland and the Netherlands and it just it just flooded through Europe and by the time the dust settled there was one overarching question who are these Protestants 
What is it that they believe? You know, for Catholicism, it was very simple. You were a Catholic if you kept the sacraments and put yourself under the authority of the Catholic Church. If you were a Catholic, it almost didn't matter what you believed in your heart about anything. I mean, who cares? The point is what you're doing is under the auspices of the Catholic Church. But the Protestants rejected that. So what were they? They didn't have a council to tell them what they believed. They didn't have a statement of faith that united all of them. They didn't have a leader who could tell them, this is what we do and this is what we don't do. They didn't even have a a language where everything was unified. I mean, in the Catholic Church, everything was done in Latin, which nobody could speak. I mean, it was easier for the priest to memorize by rote a Latin mass than it was to actually learn Latin. Nobody had any clue what was happening there, but not in the Protestant churches. That was in the real language and the Bible was there and you could read it. And what is it that these crazy Protestants believed? What defined them? They're called Protestants because they were protesting the Catholic church, but what united them? And when the dust finally settled at the end of the 1500s, they were united by what's called the five solas. Sola is just Latin for the word alone. It's five statements that define what a Protestant is. And they remain to this day. When somebody says, what's a Protestant church? It's somebody that embraces these five solas. I want to go through them real quickly. And I think the easiest way to do that is to understand that each one of these solas is the answer to a question. The first question, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And the answer is you're saved by faith alone. Faith alone. And the key word here really is alone. Listen, every religion in the world has a concept of faith. No other religion in the world has the concept of faith alone. Every religion in the world will tell you it's important that you place faith in these teachings or in that teaching or in this book or that book or this person or that person. Only Christianity says you're saved by faith alone. And this is built into our DNA. Listen, if somebody were to come up to you and ask you this question, kind sir, what must I do to be saved? You would probably answer it this way. You would probably say there's nothing you can do to be saved. You can't do anything to be saved. You can't do a single thing. You're not saved by any work or anything you do. You're saved on the basis of faith alone. You place your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you, that God became a man, that God as a man in Jesus Christ was sinless and he took upon your sins in his own body. He suffered for your sins. He died on the cross in your place, paying the penalty that you deserved and he rose from the dead three days later and you can be saved by placing faith in the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf, alone, period, end of sentence, end of paragraph, end of chapter, end of book. That's what saves you, faith alone. The second question, what must I trust? What must I trust? In a world that was shattered by the division in the Catholic Church where there were deposed popes on every street corner, it seemed. There were wars between bishops, wars between countries. Who could you possibly trust with your salvation? Do you trust your church? Do you trust the popes? Do you trust the catechisms? Do you trust the sacraments? Prior to the Reformation, the answer would have been easy. You put your trust in the sacraments. You needed to be baptized. You needed to go to confession. You needed to to receive, you needed to participate in the masses. You needed to receive last rites or final unction, extreme unction on your body when you died. That's what's so important because that's where their trust was placed. And Protestants said no to all of those things. We don't trust any of those things. We only trust Jesus Christ. There's no other one on whom we can lean. There's no other ground on which we can stand. There's no other prop which can hold us up. There's no other stretcher which can can lay us out. He alone carries us. He is the object of our salvation. He is the means of our salvation. Salvation comes through him. Salvation doesn't come through sacraments. It doesn't come through a church. It doesn't come through any person anywhere except through the person of Jesus Christ. And outside of him, there is no salvation. This is what it means to believe in solus Christus, Christ alone. And again, many other religions in the world esteem Jesus Christ. It's the cornerstone of Islam that he was a good and noble teacher, a prophet even. 
Every cult that knocks on your door steams Jesus Christ. Oh, we love Jesus. He's, you know, he is, they may say whatever he is. But the problem is they keep talking after that. (laughs) (laughs) And the more they say, the word alone grows feathers and flies away. (laughs) Salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. Third question, what must I obey? What must I obey? Are you held under the commands of popes? Are you held under the authority of a church? What about a king? What about tradition? Again, before the Reformation, there would have been three sources of authority in your life. There would have been the authority of the church. There would have been authority of scripture. There would have been authority of tradition. And all three of those mingle and all three of those bind you. After the Protestant Reformation, Protestants say no and no Yes to scripture. Scripture alone is the authority. It doesn't mean scripture is the only authority. It's scripture alone, not scripture only. It doesn't mean scripture is the only authority because the scripture itself makes it clear there's other authorities. You're bound to the authority of your country's laws. You're bound to the authority of your parents. Even elders in the the church has a limited authority in your life. There's all kinds of other authorities in the world. But when it comes to matters of of faith and salvation, scripture alone is the ultimate authority. And we understand that even to this day. We understand that you're supposed to obey the laws of the land, but if the laws of the land contradict the laws of scripture, then forget the laws of the land. We understand that you obey your parents, but if your parents command you to do something that violates scripture, then you forget the command of your parents. We get that. It's ingrained in basic Protestant DNA because it goes all the way back to sola scriptura. Scripture alone is your final authority. If the king says that you have to do this and it violates scripture, then you ignore the king and you face death. Martyrdom spread through the, by means of the Reformation because this truth spread. People were willing to die and be suffer, suffer and die because they understood that scripture alone was their authority. It alone was absolute. Fourth question, what must I earn? What must I earn? If you say, okay, I get it. I trust Jesus. I place my faith in him and I trust Jesus alone and scripture is my only absolute authority. Now What? Certainly I have to do something to prove my salvation, to make me worthy enough to put my confidence in. And let me Americanize it a little bit. Sometimes you hear somebody say, ask the question, why did God choose to save me? And I'll hear the answer, that God looked down the tunnel of time and he looked into the future and he saw what you were gonna do when you heard the gospel and he saw that you were going to do this or do that or choose him and put your faith in him so he rewound the tape and chose you because in light of what you were gonna do, he chose you because of that. Have you ever heard that answer before? What a horrible answer. (laughs) Because who are you putting your confidence in? Yourself. God looked at you and saw what you were gonna do, so he chose you. Are you you kidding? That's trusting yourself. The truth is that God looked at you and saw what you were gonna do and chose you anyway. (laughs) (laughs) That he saw your sin. He saw that you didn't do anything to deserve salvation. And that's a basic tenet of Protestantism. We understand we don't do anything to deserve our salvation. It is totally by grace alone. We don't earn it. We don't merit it. We don't work for it. It's not based on any merit in ourselves whatsoever. There was nothing hidden deep down inside of us that made us deserving of our salvation. Nonsense. None of that is there. Salvation is a gift given by grace. And a lot of people will say that salvation comes by grace, of course. But salvation is a gift given by grace alone, alone. Which leads to the fifth question. All these other four, these are just rivers that flow to this ocean. Those other four questions, they're just tributaries that build to this big ultimate question. What is the point of all of this? Some of you have been asking yourself that question for the last 13 and a half minutes. <laughs> what, is the, what is the point of all this? And by the all this, I mean life, I mean religion, I mean the gospel, I mean church, I mean grace, I mean scripture, I mean Jesus Christ. What is the point of all this? What is happening with all of this? And the answer is that everything exists for God's 
glory. Which is easy to say. It's harder to say that everything exists for God's glory alone. This is the truth that took the gospel home. Before the Protestant Reformation, as I said, the authority of the Catholic Church was universal, but it didn't go into your house. It didn't go into your life or your marriage or your parenting or your work ethic. This is the one that takes the gospel wherever you go. Before it was confined into the courtyards of the church, this is the one that it bursts through the stained glass windows and follows you all the way home, even into the private thoughts of your own mind. The question above all questions is, does what you're doing glorify God? Does what you're thinking glorify God? Does how you're conducting your marriage glorify God? Does how you're parenting glorify God? God? Does your work ethic glorify God? Does your sleep glorify God? Does your thoughts glorify God? Does your reading glorify God? Does your entertainment glorify God? Does everything glorify God in your life? That becomes the question. Does your church glorify God? Does your understanding of faith glorify glorify God? Does it glorify God? And this is the highest end of all things. We understand there's a difference between a a primary and a secondary end. Why do you go to work to get money? Well, that's not the primary end unless you love money. You go to work to get money so that you can support your family. But that's not even the primary end. You go to work to get money to support your family so that you can be a godly influence on them and demonstrate the love of God towards his children by the way you interact with your own children, provide for them. It causes you and them to glorify God by the way you work and use your money. Do you see how glorifying God, that's the primary end? Why do you watch soccer on TV? (laughs) Because it's fun and it's entertaining and you're patriotic and go team go and you're you unwind and it's every four years and those aren't primary reasons. But (laughs) it helps me marvel at the creativity of being in the image of God, that there could be a game with this complexity and strategy and (laughs) hear me out. (laughs) This complexity and strategy and beauty and I marvel at God's creative power in us and it causes me to glorify God more. (laughs) That's the primary answer. (laughs) This is... Paul's point, whether you eat or sleep or drink or read or work or relax or parent or married or single, that you do all to the glory of God alone. You have to drive it down to where that's the primary reason and motivation for what you do. And that's where we turn our attention to 2 Corinthians 4, 6. This is one of those verses that's a Mount Everest in scripture. This is one of those verses that towers over everything else in the Bible. This is one of those verses that becomes an interpretive lens for the rest of scripture. This is one of those verses that captures your thoughts. It compels how you worship, how you think about Jesus, how you live your life. It all is in focus in this verse right here. For God who said... Light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of glory of God in the face of Christ. This passage gets right to the point of soli deo gloria. This passage shows us really, and there's three particular ways in this passage that it draws out how God alone is glorified. The first way is God alone is glorified by his creation, by his creation. This whole concept begins at creation with God creating the world. Notice how Paul starts there. This is the God who said light shall shine out of darkness. He's taking you all the way back to Genesis 1. There was nothing. There was no light. There was no earth. There were no cows. And God said light. And he said earth. And he said cows. And they came into being. Everything that exists was made by God for this purpose to glorify him. And I hope you understand what that means to to glorify something. And again, another sports analogy, we get that in our American culture, what glorifying something means, especially in the realm of sports. You glorify your sports team. You buy the shirts and the, the bumper sticker and the hat and the banner for your wall and you let everybody know this is your team and you jump up and down on your friend's couches and punch their ceiling and I've heard people doing that kind of thing. 
and you yell and you cheer and you want everybody else to be excited about your team and to recognize that your team is the best team ever. They may have only won three games last year, but they are the best team ever. <laughs> Don't think too much about this, okay? Just <laughs> That's what it means to glorify something though. You're excited about it and you're pumped about it. And it's not enough for you to be excited about it and pumped about it. You want your wife to be excited about it. You want your baby to wear the t-shirt. You want your neighbors to see that that is your team and go team go. That's what it means to glorify it. You want everybody to see how cool and awesome and powerful it is. We do that in our culture with sports. We do that with honor roll students. <laughs> you put the bumper sticker in your car. You want everybody to see how smart your kid is. It's a way of glorifying your son or daughter or possibly of glorifying yourself. You have to work through your own motives in that, I think. <laughs> That's what it means to glorify something. Now, do you understand that everything Paul is saying, everything that exists was made for this purpose, to glorify God. That's why light exists. That's why the earth exists. That's why the animals exist. That's why angels exist. Everything exists to glorify God. He is the point of all creation. This is why the angels say in Isaiah chapter six, the angels sing, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The angels are not using hyperbole here. They're stating a fact. Everything in the earth exists for one point, to glorify God. You look at it and you see, you look at the way God made the world and you see his power and his holiness and his power and his creativity and his power and his ingenuity. And his, did I mention his power? <laughs> I mean, things didn't exist. And he said light and light came into being. There was no earth and he said earth and earth existed. He speaks it into being. That is the glory and the power and the wisdom of God. Everything in the earth exists for that reason. This is what Paul means when he writes in Romans eleven thirty six: for from him and through him and to him are all things. Everything that is, is from God. Everything, if it exists, it's from him. And it was made through him namely the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, and it exists to him. What does that mean, to him? It's glorifying him, it's pointing to him. Creation is God's self-glorification, his self-advertising, his self-proclamation of his own glory. He is proclaiming his glory to his son and to his spirit. It's a Trinitarian proclamation. He's proclaiming his glory to his creation that we then also join in glorifying God. We also join in worshiping him and marveling him at him about how glorious he is. This is why everything exists. And this is Paul's point back in 2 Corinthians 4. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness. He's taking you all the way back to the reason that everything exists. And that's what the world's here for. Now, not everything does that willingly, does it? We live in a sinful and fallen world. The creation itself groans against glorifying God. It strains against it. And nevertheless, God is glorified even in that even in sin, even in the fallenness, God is still glorified. Satan in his final act of rebellion, it seems, in Jesus' life had him crucified and God turns that event around to be what glorifies him more than anything else. Satan attacks Job relentlessly in the book of Job to get him to stop glorifying God. And by the end of it, God turned Satan's attack around and it caused Job to glorify God more than had Satan not attacked him. God glorifies himself even through sin. Do you understand that you were made with one purpose? To glorify God. This is why God made you. That's the only reason he made you, to glorify him. Do you understand the incredible judgment and punishment that will come upon you if you refuse to do that? If you refuse to glorify God? All of the universe will rise up against you if you refuse to glorify God because that's what you were made for. That's what the universe was made for. Beyond that, God's own holiness will judge you. The creator of the universe will judge you because you sinned against him and he's infinitely holy. 
everything in the universe was made to glorify God. And if you refuse to do that, you're missing your point. People were made to glorify God in a special way. They were made in his image. This is why it's mystifying that people, this is the great power of sin, that people refuse to glorify God. A human being that refuses to glorify God is like a baker who refuses to bake. Like an athlete who hates sports, like a doctor who hates health. A human being that refuses to glorify God is like a banker who steals money. Like a taxi cab driver who crashes all the time. You have one job, don't crash. <laughs> a human being that refuses to glorify God is like a firefighter who's an arsonist. You were made with one purpose, to glorify God, and yet that's the power of sin, that we come into the world and we refuse to do it. Which leads to the second way God is glorified in this verse, through the gospel. First, by his creation. Secondly, by his gospel. Paul says in verse six, the God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who is shown in our hearts. This same creative power at creation is now seen in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Just like God said light and there was light, earth and there was earth, cows and there was cows. God now turns to your own hearts and says, believe the gospel. You came into this world and you looked at everything that glorified God, all of his creation, everything that he made, your own purpose, you saw it all clearly and plainly so that you have no excuse and you looked at it and you said, no thanks. I'm not gonna glorify God. I'll be over here doing my own thing, glorifying myself, satisfying myself, pleasing myself, living for myself. Forget about God, who does he think he is anyway and I'm gonna live over here and do my own thing. You think that's your ultimate rebellion against God. But then the gospel comes and he speaks into, his, into your heart. All, of the crea- all the power that made the universe now is directed at your heart. And he says, in that dark heart right there, let there be light. You go from darkness to light, blindness to sight, death to life and you believe the gospel because it's so beautiful and powerful. You, you looked at the universe and you said, it's, I'm not compelled, I'll be over here. And then the beauty of the gospel captures your heart and draws you out of even that sin that you were in. It becomes more compelling, more glorifying than even creation was. Do you see these concentric circles here? The big circle is the universe. Everything that exists, exists to glorify God. But then there's a smaller circle in the middle, the gospel that glorifies God in a more precise and powerful and potent way. It's more focused that he forgives your sin and gives you forgiveness because Jesus lived a perfect life and he suffered and died for your sin. He rose from the grave on the the third day to show how glorious he is, that death couldn't hold him. All of your sins placed on him couldn't ultimately kill him and condemn him. He paid for your sin and he offers you life and you see that and you believe it People say, if everything exists to glorify God, why is there sin? Why couldn't have God created a world where there was no sin? Because God is more glorified in a world where there is sin and he forgives it with the power of the gospel than he is in a world without sin. It's a very simple answer. It's a very profound answer. That God is glorified through his gospel more than he would have been glorified in the universe without sin. This is what Paul means here. The God who said, let there be light out of darkness caused the light of the gospel to shine in your hearts. In fact, look at his language here in verse six, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Jump back up to verse four. See the parallelism in the second half of verse four? The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. In verse six, it's the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. In verse four, it's the light of the knowledge of the gospel. They're parallel. The power of God and the power of the gospel are one in the same. It's as if God's, all of his creative power is now focused laser-like on the gospel. Oh, how glorious is the gospel. This causes us, this balance of judgment and truth and grace and wrath all poured out in Jesus Christ is a profound display of God's glory. But there's even a third reason Paul gives in verse six. God alone is glorified by his creation, by his gospel, and thirdly, by his son. Look at the end of verse six. 
by his glory of God in the face of Christ. If you go back up to verse four, you see the parallelism here, who is the image of God. In verse six, the face of Christ, image and face being parallel here. Jesus Christ is the image of God. His, God's glory is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, in his person, in the incarnation, when God became a man, when the second person of the Trinity, through whom all things were created, came to earth and became a man, God's glory was seen even more particularly in his life. Again, the big circle, all of the universe glorifies God. The smaller concentric circle, the gospel glorifies God even more powerfully and more acutely. And then the bullseye right in the middle, the person of Jesus Christ is the clearest expression of God's glory. Everything exists for him, through him, to him. He is God incarnate. He displays the glory of God in a physical way, more profound than simply saying the gospel, more profound than the universe itself. It all focuses back on the person of Jesus Christ. Verse four calls him the image of God. That Greek word, phota, we get our word photograph from it. We understand a photograph is an image of something. I have a a daughter who can take selfies on my cell phone of herself, obviously, on my cell phone. One of you must have taught her that because she did not learn narcissism from me. You say, can I see your, your daughter? And I can take out my phone and show you a picture of her. That's her, there she is. Jesus is the image of God, the picture of God. Now that's a cool Trinitarian point and all, but that's not Paul's point here. It is beyond just talking about the Trinity. He's talking about the glory of God is seen precisely, exactly in the person of Jesus Christ. All things point to him. This is all encompassing. This is why the gospel now follows you home. And the glory of God has claim over your thoughts and your marriage and your parenting and your finances and your leisure and your study and everything in your life, it falls back to this question. Does it glorify God? And you need to ask yourself that question. Does what you're doing glorify God? Because if it doesn't, you're doing it wrong. Does what you're thinking glorify God? Because if it doesn't, you need to take your thoughts captive. Does the way you're living glorify God? Because if it doesn't, you're living wrongly. Does the way you worship glorify God? Because if it doesn't, you're not really worshiping. This is why as a result of the the Reformation, Preaching came back into churches. Corporate singing came back into churches. Living the Christian life together and serving one another came back into churches because suddenly the point was in the sacraments. Now suddenly the point is let me glorify God in everything. I need to understand how to, how to worship him. I need to understand how to think about him. I need to understand the gospel so that I can love it and glorify God in every single thing that I do. And the best way to tell if you're doing that in the way that you worship is to go back to those five questions. What do you have to do to be saved? Faith alone in Jesus Christ. What do you trust for your salvation? Only Jesus Christ alone. It doesn't come any other way. What do you obey? Only scripture, scripture alone. What do you earn? Nothing, it's all by grace alone. And all of this exists for God's glory alone.